Hey friends, uh, welcome to installment number three of our uh, Unraveled Sermon Series. I'm Pastor Tim, and uh, I have with me here a, a, a dear friend, uh, Pastor Darren Miller, uh, and he serves at Memorial Church of God in Christ, uh, which is on Buck Lane in Haverford. So he's a, in Haverford Township, yes. and uh, he also happens to be the president of our ministerium, and I'm the vice president. Uh, so Mr. President... <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. This is wonderful. So can you tell us a little bit about first uh, Church of God in Christ, the the tradition? Yes. Yes. The Church of God in Christ goes all the way back to 1897. Uh, It was founded by uh, a younger man at the time that had come out of the Baptist Church. He um, was preaching. uh, He had 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 an experience. Uh, Some people may have heard of the Azusa Street revivals and things of that nature that took place back in um, 1900 and uh, it was a movement that had taken place very similar to the book of Acts chapter 2 but it was happening in California Los Angeles area started in an area uh, or a house known as the Bonnie Bray house on Body Bray Street and um, because of this uh, the, the Holy Ghost was being poured out among people in a way that had not been seen for a long time so uh, at the time Elder Mason, who was a part of the uh, Baptist Church, wanted this fullness of experience. He said, there's got to be more to this than what I'm doing. So he goes seeking after uh, more of God. He goes from Arkansas all the way out to Los Angeles, California, where uh, there's a revival going on. Long story short, he gets baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost in the same manner that took place in Acts 2. He then comes back to Arkansas begins preaching sanctification. The Baptist Church says, you got to go with that stuff. Get out. Sanctification, just for uh, the, the, the lay folk at home, right. is, is the idea that when the Holy Spirit comes into your life, your life, you'll act better, too. That's right. Lutherans love justification. Yeah. We don't want to change anything about our actions. Right, right. We just want to feel like God loves us anyway. <laughs> and so he's talking about your life actually changing because yeah. the Holy Spirit enters in. Imagine that. Isn't that something? Wow. Called? Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's what takes place. He comes back, and uh, he then um, is kicked out of the Baptist church, but he continues to preach sanctification and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, by that, the Lord moves on him and lets him know that if he establishes a movement known as the Church of God in Christ, uh, that there will never be an auditorium large enough to hold the people. But. And truly today, the Church of God in Christ is the largest black Pentecostal denomination in the world. Uh, it has um, amassed well over 7.2 uh, million members, I believe, at this point. And we are in uh, pretty much every country uh, around the world. And so um, that's what we're, we're part of, that particular denomination. But really, uh, in my philosophy, it's about salvation and not denomination. Amen. That's, Amen. That's the T- tell me more about that, salvation and not denomination. Sure, because one day when we get to heaven, there's not going to be a Lutheran section, there's not going to be a Pentecostal section, there's not going to be a Catholic section, there's not going to be an Episcopal section, a Baptist section, uh, an AME section. The Bible's none but the righteous. As long as your life has been changed and we are serving, we're right, we might be riding in different boxcars. But we're riding the same train trying to get to the same heaven to worship the same God to spend eternity with the Lord of us all. And so that's why it's important. So that, because when we talked on the phone and and prepped a little bit for this conversation, we talked about that kingdom reality, right? Everybody gathered around the throne worshiping. Mm -hmm. And you're right, they're they're not in denominational sections. They're also not divided up by race. That's exactly right. <laughs> uh, that's right. That's right. In in God, there is no there's no difference in, as as far as we're concerned. Man sets up these 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 partitions, but then when we look over in the book of uh, Ephesians, the second chapter, the Bible talks about how Christ came to break down the walls of division between us, and it's because of Christ that we are. We are joined together as brothers and sisters in Christ. If you cut me, I'm going to bleed red. If I cut you, you're going to bleed red. Mm-hmm. And it's the blood of Jesus that takes black sin, red blood taking black sin and making it white as snow. And that's how we come washed. And all of us, when we make it in, are going to have a white robe. That's what the Bible tells us in Revelation. Yeah, That's where we're trying to get. 
So I, I, I also, you know, in, in our, in this day and age, in American society, I'm always, I'm always hesitant. I'm always afraid to use that white black imagery where black, sin is black and, uh, -huh. uh and, and, and goodness it's and purity is white. <laughs> uh, so it, it's one of those things you can do it, <laughs> but I, I, yes. I, I, I don't want to reinforce the, you know, sin, uh, you know, black, bad, white, good. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, but I, you I'm, know what? Here's some things that just go along with, with society. And when I say that, for example, if we look at years ago, like the, the, the Westerns, and some people watch Westerns, you know. The, good guys wore the white hats. That was, just, the that was it, yeah. what it is. Um, but also, when you look at other um, things, who were the people who wore the black attire. If a priest came in, or a pastor came in, or a religious person came in, into a situation when it came time to chase Dracula. Dracula's bad. But those priests wore their black with their white collar. Yeah. All right? So the good guys still wore black yeah. in that particular sense. So it, just, it all depends on, on what uh, scenario yeah. you put it in. But I, but I like the whole, we're all going to get the same color robe. You know, yeah. It, and uh, that's right. We we will we will be one. Um, so we will be one someday. Mm -hmm. Is it time to is it time to just snap our finger and start acting like it? <laughs> it would it would be wonderful. <laughs> but of course we we don't we live in a fallen world, mm -hmm. and we have to deal with the fact that even though we're boarding for heaven, we live on earth, mm -hmm. and we have to deal with all of the things that take place. For some people to act like um, you know. I don't. I don't see color. I don't see race. Mm -hmm. Well, then you must be blind. Uh, it, it 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 might mean yes. You you're not you're not bound by the confines that come along with it. But if you look at me, if you look at me, it is impossible not to see that I'm a black man. Yeah. If you're not blind. Now, I mean, it just is what it is. Sure. However, we don't. That that restriction does not uh, confine us into brotherhood in Christ. Mm. So the, the whole not being colorblind, or realizing that we're not colorblind, uh, I think from a perspective of, of sin, you know, I look at Romans 7, and a few weeks ago we used this text. Um, Romans 7, the good that I want to do, I cannot do. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I understand that racism is so deeply ingrained in all the systems that we have mm -hmm. that it's like it's like in my bones and if i don't notice and acknowledge and even celebrate the fact that you're a black man right i'm i'm not going to be able to check my prejudices along with it and mm. see if there are microaggressions happening and and uh see if i'm discounting your experience because of your color so mm -hmm. uh it's really important that we remember uh, that you know while that kingdom reality is this colorblind right 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 <clears throat> We have so much work to do to get there. Sure, sure. Yeah. And I, I, I firmly believe that um, viewing race is a little bit different than discrimination. Hmm. They're, 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 they're two different things. One can lead to the next. And a lot of times it's because of what we don't understand. It, we, we fear, we tend to fear what we don't understand. Hmm. Um, it's to, to discriminate against any nationality, no matter what it is is opposed to God's word. Sure. And we don't stand for that as, as clergymen. We don't stand for that as people who lead congregations. That the, the mistreatment of anybody, whether it's a white person coming into a black church, or an Indian person coming into a black church, or a, an Asian person coming into a white church, there should be no ostracism, because we're again, we're all children of Christ. And that's where I think the difference comes in. Because again, you can't ignore the fact we're different. God made us different. And he did it for a reason. Yeah. But it's what do you do with the differences that are there? How do you respond to them and how does that drive your actions? So I remember in seminary, uh, we, had, we had the Urban Theological Institute. Uh, we had, you know, a lot, of, a lot of my classmates came out of a black church experience. And I remember thinking to myself, well, what the heck? Why, why do they have to have black church? Mm. Can't they just have church church? Can't we all just be one and, and I, I noticed myself out of frustration uh, blaming it on that something? my black friends and colleagues and thinking that they were the ones drawing that division. Well sometimes it is. 
Tell me more about that. Sometimes it is. Um, see, again, I think that when we look at the term racism, again, it being a discriminatory act, sure. it's because it's we're, we're comparing ourselves against something that we, we deem to be uh, either better or worse than what it is that we're doing. So we have this plumb line. Now the plumb line is usually never, the, it's not the word of God, it, it's, it's some figure or some person or some group of people. And we measure ourselves up against that to be able to say, oh yes, I am a racist, or no, I'm not a racist. And that becomes the plumb line. Um, so there's something called reverse racism that is just as prevalent where, like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, Sunday morning in the United States of America is the most segregated time that takes place every single week because we tend to group together with people that we understand. Sure. We understand what they do. We understand how they do it. We have a commonality of language, and because we have a commonality of language, it translates into a commonality of how we worship. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we get stuck. The elevator gets stuck right there as to how we worship, and it never goes to who we worship. Yeah. And I think because of that, because there are some churches that are very much multicultural. They have something for, for everybody. That, and they enjoy uh, black, white singing together, Spanish, you know, different people just coming together and worshiping God. Everybody has not gotten into that yeah. level yet. Yeah. But and, it does exist. But that's it, it requires compromise on all sides, right? So uh, I once heard it said, we're not a melting pot, we're a fruit salad, right? Because in a melting pot, everything just comes together and it becomes right, right. the same. And it just becomes some watered down version of what every, every beautiful individual were, mm -hmm. was, you know? Um, and here's the thing about fruit salad. You ever have grapefruit and fruit salad? Yeah, it, it will. It's the worst. It turns everything into That's grapefruit. Exactly right. Everything tastes like grapefruit. Yep. And so my, my concern is that one dominant narrative, mm -hmm. uh, upon coming together and thinking that we're doing a truly multicultural thing, yeah. will all just start to taste like grapefruit. And in this case, white people are the grapefruit. <laughs> uh, so I, 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 I lament and I, and I mourn the fact that Sunday morning is so segregated absolutely I also recognize as a white person I did that I mean you know my ancestors did that through Jim Cl Jim Crow laws mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. literally couldn't worship in the same place and if we could right, right, right. we had to sit in different yeah, different yeah, sections and yeah. you you had to sit in the back and mm -hmm. I could sit up front right right and a lot of the a lot of the churches became segregated out of old laws and then developed their own beautiful individualized styles and for all people it would take an enormous amount of compromise to break oh, yeah. what we have yeah, yeah, yeah. in 1979 the Lutheran Church uh, uh, a bunch of different denominations within the Lutheran Church put out a unified hymnal and said every Lutheran Church is going to use this hymnal and if you go to a Lutheran Church you know what you're getting the problem is Imagine the nature of the hymnal, the, the worship style of the right, hymnal. Right, right, right. It's going to be geared towards what it is that they're familiar with. Northern yeah. European, German, Scandinavian, right. Lutheran worship. Uh -huh. uh, and we are now the whitest denomination in America. Wow. Because we thought that we could water down worship and just make everybody worship our way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and because of it, 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 attracts, it attracts a certain group of people. Yeah. Just like in our space, it attracts a certain group of people. Even though, even though, and you've experienced it. I love it. Oh, I love it. Oh, it's so beautiful. It's so cool. Oh. You, you have experienced it. When we do it God's way, we're, there are people that are still talking to me. Um, for those of you that are viewing, we, we had a service. We had a service not too long ago, um, a couple years ago, where we came together uh, at the church that I pastor. Uh, for Thanksgiving. Yeah, November 2018. Yeah, awesome. And we had uh, a time together where it was an interfaith service, but yet um, it, it maintained the, the, the overall flavor of the the more, it was kind of, I, I, I don't want to say jaded, but it maintained the character of the African-American worship experience yeah. with, with uh, the... Um, the hand clapping, foot stomping type of gospel music and stuff of that nature. We handed out tambourines. Yes, so, yes, yeah. yes. But look at the oneness. 
people people came to this service and cried. Yeah. I mean, I saw yeah. it. Yep. I saw tears coming down people's eyes. Even at the time, the address that was given by the uh, the uh, the person who was given the address couldn't even contain himself because he was so moved by what was taking place that we looked out over the audience and it was like salt and pepper, but yet at the same time, when it came time to sing, he's got the whole world in his hands. When it came time to sing, come on everybody, let's praise the Lord. We were all together. Yeah. yeah. You literally didn't see that. Even if we couldn't clap on the same beat. <laughs> we, we, <laughs> he's a prolific musician, so you get it. Uh, yeah, some of us were clap, clapping on the one and three, some were clapping on the two and four. It's okay, it was beautiful. Yep, and, yep, yeah, yep. and it doesn't have to be pretty all the time. And, th- and the same right. goes with our dialogue. Mm-hmm. You know, it, Yes. It, 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 we, don't, we, we don't have to, it doesn't have to be perfect and polished all the time. Uh, but, but when the intentionality is there, it, right. it can be a wonderful thing. And uh, the, yeah. the, 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 um, we had a we had a worship service a year later at the Quaker Meeting House. Yes, yes. Oh my right. gosh, we had yes. we had Jewish people talking about what they learned <laughs> in shul and referencing Hebrew, you know, Hebrew scriptures. Yeah. And then we had you know old black church ladies going, "Thank you, Jesus. Yep. Thank you, Jesus." As they're doing it in the same room. <laughs> and I was like, "This is the kingdom. This is it." And the Spirit moves more fully yes. when we are not in our comfort zone. Isn't that something? Oh, isn't that something? Yeah. And and these are these are experiences that we remember. You almost feel it all over again because it's just it's it was such an experience. Yeah. yeah. You know. Yeah. So I'm, that's great. I'm happy to be feeling that way. I've missed you. Oh. oh I want to like I want to give you a hug, but we can't. Uh, you have to do it virtually. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I was hoping that we, we might be able to do a little Bible study together. Yes. Yes. All right, by cool. all means, surely. Uh, so this is uh, a scripture that we had earlier in the summer or late spring. Um, and it's, it's Exodus chapter 3, Moses and the burning bush. And, and something about this just spoke to me when, when talking about racial justice. And, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. we'll look at it. Um, so uh, Exodus 3, beginning with the first verse. Um, Moses was keeping the flock of his father Jethro, uh, his father-in-law Jethro. Okay, we're going to stop there. Um, <laughs> as a white pastor, yes. I'm keeping my flock. Mm-hmm. Now, it could be the really good weather last Sunday, but I noticed that as we started talking about race and as, you know, as week two of the sermon series, uh, we fell off significantly in people, in viewership, because this is a really difficult thing to address. Yeah. I gave people a heads up weeks ahead of time, and I'm sure a lot of people just don't want to tune into this kind of stuff and, and will turn a blind eye. Um, but I've often thought that keeping my flock yes. means keeping them safe. From asking difficult questions, it's 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 that, and the the whole awareness piece. Again, we tend to be afraid of what we don't understand. Mm. It's it's just like you were saying earlier about your ancestors. All right. So because of that, this is not something that Tim did. Yeah. And so I can't be overly sensitive toward Tim for Tim trying to ask questions to understand how it is that I feel. You can't. Say, I know how you feel. Yeah. No more than we could with, with anybody. Yeah. We don't, you know, you, 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 you're able to sympathize and get an understanding. And when you ask questions, a lot of times it's the motive behind what it is that you do that will come forth. Yeah. If you're asking questions to try and understand how to keep the flock or how to be able to address this and whatnot, what can tend to happen? People, because they don't understand it, know that for people it's a soft spot. Or it's a uh, it's a, a quick flame, but again, it's a, it's both ways. It's it's the gift side and the take side to be able to understand each other. I've also told people that we have to be really careful when, when asking black people to fix our racism. And before you reach out to someone and find out how they feel, know that a lot of people have risked that vulnerability through mm-hmm. books uh, and and yeah. have written yeah. full uh, you know or wonderful accounts of their feelings about race and how microaggressions affect them and what to be on guard against. And so I think before reaching out and burdening someone by reliving racial trauma to you, whether they trust you or not, it's also good to do that reading and do that research as well. You'd find, though, um, a lot of people are not hesitant to... They're not hesitant to talk about their experience. 
because they want to know that somebody's listening. For so much, for a long time, you know, people have experienced things, and they're not. It, it falls on deaf ears, and that's what causes riots because they're not being heard. They got all this pent up aggression, and nobody's listening. Yeah. So you get marches and riots and looting and all of the bad things that come along with just trying to express yourself. So. Yeah. We're going to get to those riots. Uh, as landscapers, work very hard in our yeah. midst, so I hope the audio comes through. Uh, otherwise, I'll have to subtitle. I get subtitle or um, I'll dub over our voices. Okay. okay. No, I won't do that. Uh, so um, there an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame out of fire uh, out of a bush. And he looked, and the bush was blazing, yet uh, it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. So, I think our burning bush took place in like a burning auto zone in Minneapolis. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. After the George Floyd incident uh, after after he was lynched yeah we had a, a burning bush moment and we saw the bush and and Moses in that moment had a choice he he could either see that bush and go oh another bush is burning because it was the desert and bushes burn yeah, exactly right. yeah. um, he could have been you know and, and we had a choice we could have said well that you know condemn the rioting and take an issue with the rioting rather than the reason it happened uh-huh. Or we could say, why is why is this happening? Right. Why is this why is this bush burning? Why is this auto zone burning? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're not. It seemed like a line was drawn in the sand at that point. Yep. 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 And we got to be in a place where we can. I don't grieve the auto zone. Sorry, I, it's a building, and everyone was you know everyone came out safe, and it's only stuff. Um, but we can be in a place where, where we can be sad that rioting happens. Sure, sure, that's right. And also devastated about the reason that right. it happened. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's almost like a pressure cooker. Mm. You can put something in the pressure cooker, but if you don't have the little gasket on the top to relieve the pressure, if you try and tamp it down, eventually it's going to just blow off. And it all it, all, it just takes the right amount to make that happen because yeah. of this pressure cooker. We keep a lid on it. We don't allow it to, we keep a lid. And that's what can happen. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Um, and then Moses said, uh, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is, uh, is not burned up. Okay, verse four. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called out to him out of the bush. Moses, Moses. So God didn't just call out, call him from the burning bush. He waited till he looked at the bush. Isn't that something? So God will speak to us if and when we look at what's happening and start asking questions about the injustice. He'll do something to get your attention. But what you do now, once he has your attention, makes all the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Moses, Moses, he said. Here, I, uh, And Moses said, here I am. Then he said, Come no closer, remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you stand is holy ground. He said further, I am the the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, and he was afraid to look at the Lord. So you know the means by which Moses grew up. Yep, that's right. He grew up in Farrah's house. I mean, uh-huh. in Farrah's courts. He, he, his mom, his adopted mother, was Farrah's daughter, right? He grew up with that privilege. Uh huh. And he hid his face. Is that something? I frequently want to hide my face when doing this work. Yeah. yeah. I started reading a book called *Me and White Supremacy* by Leila Saad. Uh, brilliant, brilliant book. It's like, it's like the Bible for dismantling white supremacy. Really well done. Uh, ri- written by a black Muslim woman, woman who grew up in England, so she's not even American. Well, how about that? But the way she does it is just amazing. 
and I was like, okay, I can. It's it's a twenty eight day devotional, and you're supposed to go through, you know, this twenty eight day period, and each day read a thing. But I was like, you know what? I've done enough of the work. I I can read through this pretty quickly. I have other books to read. <laughs> And I got to like day four, and it started talking about a phenomenon called white exceptionalism. Mm. The idea that, you know, I can be exempt from doing work, or that I've done enough, or that I'm okay, or good enough, because heck, everything else in society has told me that I'm worthy. And so I'll, I'll even apply that to racial justice. Wow. And then, so I'm sitting there, all, all on day one, reading day four, and I just, I read about this, and I was like, oh. No, I'm doing it, and I fell into like a deep, like one week long depression. Oh no, because I, I, I want to take it seriously. I want to do the work. Yeah, yeah, I hid my face. Wow. June was intense for so many, mm -hmm. and I, I, I can tell you, for well intentioned white people who don't like racism, but don't know much about doing that work. June was a really intense month. And then a lot of us just kind of hit our faces. We learned enough to realize how broken the system is. Yeah. And then we feel uh, ashamed, really ashamed. Wow. Is, it, is it because you feel like you can't, you can't fix what's broken? And so Moses said... Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm not ignoring the question, but... Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of, uh, of the, their taskmakers. Indeed, I know their sufferings and have come down to deliver them from Egypt and to bring them out of the land to a good, broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Right? And we're going to skip ahead. Mm-hmm. Verse 11, Moses said, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of, this, out of Egypt? And he said, I will be with you and I shall be the sign for you mm -hmm. uh, that it is I who sent you. And then, you know, he goes on to make excuses. Make excuses. <laughs> so I wasn't, I wasn't avoiding your question. No, I, I, know, I, just, I know. Yeah, I just thought Moses is experiencing, you know, I... The system is so jacked up. Who am I to think that I can do anything about it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yet, if if not now, then when? You know, it's it's almost though. It's what I tell. Um, I've been saying the same thing to the congregation. Now, e church. <laughs> um, that is that is the the, the vast congregation everywhere. Uh, as just being one voice in a, in a very large ocean. Celebrate the small victories. Mm. What you're doing here right now is doing something. Celebrate the small victories. We can't save the world. Jesus did that. And the world still doesn't even believe it. He saved the whole world. And yet, people don't accept it. So, what can we do? Take, celebrate the baby steps. Because I, I used an analogy to say that um, you can have a big mountain in front of you. And yes, you can have faith to speak to the mountain and the mountain can get up and just walk away. But if you speak to the mountain and the mountain doesn't move, you can still move that mountain one pebble at a time. It might not be all picked up and moving at the same time, but it's moving. That's the key. You can dismantle it one pebble at a time. If you get enough hands taking little pebbles, that mountain will start to come down. And, and yeah, that's that's awesome because I'm noticing that this this branch of the civil rights movement is especially the last couple months and and COVID COVID lockdown frustration economic despair it's all kind of contributing to it but we're all wanting to make changes really quick and I'm seeing a lot of white saviors com coming out and uh, wanting to try and just fix everything and change every mind and you know the be beautiful thing about this work is anytime progress has been made in society 100% uh -huh. of people were not on board but we still made progress that's exactly right 
You have to celebrate the small victories. Yeah. You really do. If you can change one life or, or, or point somebody in the right direction, that person affects somebody and they affect somebody and it becomes a ripple effect. Yeah. Just like the converse. When I see the little children that walk along and they hold each other's hands, they're not looking and saying, that's a white kid, I'm holding that, or that's a black kid. They're just kids. They have to be taught how to now look at things that divide. Other than that, they don't know. They're just kids. If somebody my size, about my height, I really like them, that's the key. That, and they, that's all they care about. But we, have to, we, we also, I think, have to be careful to think that just not being racist, that's not enough. Right. You know, it, we, yeah, we yeah, also, yeah, we have right. to be actively right. anti-racist. And, and that whole racism is learned. It's, it's great if you're not teaching your kids racism, mm -hmm. but know that the rest of society... That's exactly right. That the whole system and everything exists. Yes. yes. From Hollywood to the media to, you know, your schools even, will teach racism to your children. True. And so we need to teach our kids how to dismantle all those images that's and all right. those lessons that we learned. And that's when I was, uh, when we started out, when we opened up, I was saying how we as churchmen, we teach against the mistreatment of any group. They're all God's children. It's the bottom line. They're all God's and And, and when we find mistreatment but against any race, color, or creed, that's part of what we say when the Lord says or the Bible tells us that we are many members but one body. That's what it's talking about. Every part has been added as God sees fit to add. And that's what we have to teach, you know, as, as pastors. We can't change. No matter, I, I can turn plaid trying to preach about racism and all that. Some people will hear it, some won't. Yeah. And that's doing your part and finding out finding out what your role is is, is a great play. Right? So first off, learn, right? Learn. Right, right, right. Do the reading. Uh, and our racial justice task force um, mm -hmm. actually has a uh, like a, a document, a, a running document where we just keep adding books and articles and stuff Excellent. so that people Excellent. can do the work and learn. Um, and as you do the work, if you're a lawyer, uh -huh. consider doing pro bono work to get incorporated, you know, to get incorporation, you know, paperwork sure, sure. for uh, black-owned businesses. Or if if you're well off, consider contributing to. Even if you're not well off, consider contributing to charitable causes that right. uh, that that will help causes of racial justice. Um, if you're good at food, find a way to serve not as a white savior, mm -hmm. but as a as an ally, as a friend. That's exactly uh, and, you right. You know, right. And so no matter what it is that you're good at, there's a way for you to do that that serves this cause. That's right. That's right. right. We have the answer in the church. Yeah, we have the answer. And I, I firmly believe, and I could have some people that disagree or whatever the case is, that's all right. I got big shoulders. But uh, this whole, even, even the pandemic, none of us asked for this, we didn't look for it, but none of this came as a surprise to God. Mm. He knew last year, the year before, 20 years ago, he knew that this day was coming. So there's a reason as to why he allows things to take place. There's a reason for everything. It's, will, we, will we have enough fortitude to go with what God is giving us as the answer for the world? Or will we do what you said before? Will we just continue to stay within our protected walls, never reach out, never do anything about it, and just kind of hide? Yeah. The Lord is trying to get us. Look at how he forced us. He forced us into doing some of what some of us have talked about. We've been streaming at Memorial Church for the last two years. Yeah. But never on the level that we're doing now. We're reaching more people now than we were, than we could fit in the church. And I, and I, I would say that's indicative same, of most people. Same here. Yeah, absolutely. Of most churches. Now, I won't, I won't say that God made COVID-19 happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, we, we might disagree on theodicy or at least the way that we're going to articulate it. I wouldn't say he made it. He allowed it. Okay. He allowed it. So, I... All I can say, it happened, mm -hmm. and and you know the Book of Job taught me to not not question God's intentions or even actions in, in the midst of, of tragedy. Uh -huh. What and what I can also say is that resurrection is happening out of this Good Friday. 
You know, the, most definitely. This world, uh, something bad has happened, of course, and I'm st- I'm still grieving it, and I mm-hmm. I bear that to them. And what, someone yeah. someone called my worship services hostage videos once because, I, like, sometimes the pain is just so great. I can't, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but we see we see that pain, that frustration spilling out in into wanting to do something. That's right. And and wanting to actually make this world a better place in ways that we can right now. And like I said a moment ago, we're reaching people yeah. that we couldn't reach before. Some folks who couldn't get to 747 Buck Lane or some people who couldn't get over here to Brookline Boulevard. We're now reaching them. Yeah, it's true. It's true. And hopefully through this, we've reached people, we've changed hearts, we've uh, yeah. given some direction. And we haven't given a step-by-step process to mm-hmm. fix racism. No. <laughs> because each individual is going to have their process and everybody gets to start somewhere. That's exactly right. That's been my mantra through this. That's right. You know, I, and I, I want to remove the shame. It, it's really bad. Like, there's a big stigma around racism because mm-hmm. it's bad. It's yeah. sinful. Mm-hmm. I, I have personally called myself a racist mm. in these because I, I, I think it's important that we know every one of us has prejudices that we need to root out and mm. that we have to address. And they, that often manifest themselves as racism, mm-hmm. you know. And and so I don't. The second I call someone else a racist and me not a racist, I absolve yeah. myself from doing that work. Well, that's what I was saying before. It's that plumb line. You you use another another person to be able to to measure yourself against. Yeah. And I I think that it's different. What yeah. God wants to do in us is different than than that. Amen. Everybody gets to start somewhere, and everyone has a role in this. Right. And so finding that role is is an individual thing, mm-hmm. for sure. Mm-hmm. I love you. I'm, Likewise, I, I'm I'm so glad you came here. This I, is my friend. <laughs> I, I I I'm I'm so grateful. And one thing that I didn't say is that you didn't have to do this. In fact, I I know you well enough at this point, and I know that you've done this for other congregations as well mm-hmm. in our community that I knew that it was okay and I, and I hope that you regard me as safe enough to have this conversation. I'm, I'm, I'm honored. I was honored well, to even be asked. Thank you. And, and um, I don't want to be a hypocrite and say, don't ask your black friends to fix your racism. Uh, because when a certain amount of work is done, when, when you know someone has thick, thick enough skin that they can handle you and your BS, right? Because mm-hmm. I'm sure I got enough of it. You know, like, I'm tough to deal with sometimes. Uh, I, 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 I so appreciate that you were here. You didn't have to. It wasn't. It's not your responsibility to fix our racism, and yet you you've you've helped us so much in this time. Oh, that's great. I, that's all I want to do is just be able to be a help. And likewise, you all have helped me. That it, like I said, it's reciprocal. We're brothers and sisters in Christ, first and foremost. And everything that falls underneath that. There's some, some things that you have that I can use, and there's some things that I have that you can use. But we're all under Christ, and that's the key. When, 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 it's, when it's safe again, I cannot wait to go back to Memorial. <laughs> oh. And i, I, I got to bring some of you all with me. Yeah, it, oh, it's just, we got something for you. It's so fun. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It's amazing. Uh, may I ask you to pray us out? Yes, my, by all means. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time that we have had here together. Yes. God, I give you praise and I give you glory because you made mankind in your own image. Mm-hmm. You gave us all intellects. You gave us all the power and the freedom of choice. God, I praise you because even in the midst of everything that we're experiencing, you are yet God. And you know how to be able to bring us together if we have a heart and a mind to come together. I thank you for Pastor Tim Johansson and for all that he's doing with the congregation over here at Temple Lutheran. And thank you for the audience that you have allowed him to be able to reach, even with the message and the burden that God has put on his heart. I pray, Lord, for everybody who's listening and watching, that you will prick something on the inside of us to be able to celebrate the small victories that we have and know that as we step forward in you, you will give us the guidance, the direction, and the know-how to be able to make a difference in this world. God, I praise you because we are not of this world, but we're in this world. And when the time comes, we will, when our pilgrimage is to end, we want to make sure that we land on those shores to be able to be in fellowship and in in worship with you forever and ever. 
I thank you because you're the God of all. You're the Savior of us, and we give you glory and praise. Bless us as we go forward in you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. amen. Thank you. Again, I want to give you a hug or shake your hand or something, but <laughs> not going to. Uh, thank you for being here. Seriously. Man, it was, it was my pleasure.